welcome everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you again on our second digital today, 17th of November, 2021. And um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the speaker and the, and the topic. So we have David Shire. He is a professor of practice in artificial intelligence and innovation. He's an expert in different topics. He's a person that has experience working in different universities, also an entrepreneur, a business person, very much inspiring and engaged with digital transformation and innovation. So David, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to our DigiTalk. Please, the floor is yours. Great, well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for hopping in on a, uh, what is today, Wednesday afternoon, um, to spend a little time talking about AI, ethics, and the future of work. You know, when I, when I try and express to people how profound the impact of artificial intelligence will be on society and already has been, um, I get some strange looks sometimes. Uh, you know, they, they call me a madman, uh, to quote uh, uh, Thanos from the MCU. But, but we, we should worry about AI. And, and, and we should also be excited by AI. And we're going to talk about both of those things um, uh, in, in the next few minutes. Uh, but before we do, I thought it would be good for us to get a common definition of AI. And so uh, if you go to um, Kahoot, uh, we're going to do a little word cloud and, uh, and see what you guys have to think about um, what is AI. So Myrna is going to show us how to do that, but you go to kahoot.it. So it's K-O-A-H-O-O-T, kahoot.it. And then you put in the pin uh, 8986449. So go ahead and throw in there, you know, how do you think we should define AI? What is AI? So we invite all participants to go to uh, www.kahoot.it. As you see here, you can go in uh, with your uh, computers or with your mobiles. And then the system will ask you um, a PIN number. The PIN number is 8986449. So just throw it in there. Whatever first comes to mind, when you think about AI, what is AI? How can we define AI? I'm not sure I understand what HCH or CM is or Renato. Uh, they are they are entering now their names. So we are waiting oh, for see. people to join. So these are these are their um, nicknames. Ah, okay, got it, got it. Okay, these are our Kahooters. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so I give I, I would say let's give them a couple of more minutes to join. What, we'll, we'll, we'll wait one more minute and then we'll get going. I don't want to spend too, too much time on uh, technical logistics, but um, I'm just curious to sort of hear from people. Why, why don't we launch it, Marina? And, okay. and let's just see what our, what our brave pioneers have to say. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> this countdown. All right, what is artificial intelligence? So type in your answers. What do you think AI is? Just type it in. You'll have about 20 seconds to complete it and, uh, and then we'll take a look at what we have. We have five players and one answer, two answers. Here we go, three answers. Anyone, four answers. Okay, we're getting there. Five answers, okay. What do we got? Let's see it. Computer brain, machine intelligence, working technology. Okay. So um, let me take the screen share back now, Myrna, please. Yes, sure. And I'll, I'll kind of offer up, you know, what I will use as a working day. So can everyone see my screen again? Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. So, so I, I'm going to say, 
artificial intelligence is a machine that thinks like a person. And, and I put things in quotation marks because you know we're, we're not actually sure if these things ever will think in the same way human beings think, but, but they give the appearance of thinking and, and that's all that really matters. Um, it's important to remember that AI is not new, right? It's been around since the 1940s when Alan Turing created the first true AI systems to crack the Enigma code in World War II. Um, uh, in the 1980s, we saw the emergence of machine learning, which let us do things like facial recognition and, and other cool things. And, and it, it kind of could understand human speech and turn it into data or text, but, but not very well. Um, you know, machine learning reached certain limits. So it was good for some things. You'd pour data in and it would give you better and better answers up to a point. And then after that point, it stopped working so well. In kind of about 15 years ago, um, we saw the emergence of deep learning. And deep learning really got big, really in 2016, when Google began open sourcing TensorFlow, their deep learning library. With deep learning, you've got layers upon layers of computation, um, which structurally looks like the human brain. And that's where we saw things like the, the you know, Amazon Echo and these other you know, sort of speech voice assistants that, that began to really function well in, in useful ways. So I've written several books. I recently published a book on AI and the future of work. I dictated about a third of it. Uh, and so the, the, you know, my phone was able to understand what I said well enough for me to get that transcribed. Um, I also wrote a couple of pages in the book with an AI, GPT-3, a very powerful deep learning system. Uh, and it was indistinguishable from my own writing. So, you know, deep learning, just to double click on this, is really where AI gets useful. So older machine learning algorithms kind of plateaued. They got better and better the more data you poured in up to a point, and then they just flatlined. With deep learning, the more data you put in, the better it gets. And this leads to some interesting things. So if we think about applications and in industry, and we look at, you know, challenger banks like Revolut and Starling and Monzo, or, you know, I use Wise. Um, these are 50% less expensive to build and require 90% fewer people to run. You're replacing people with sophisticated AI systems. Another example, transportation, right? So if we had computers driving our cars and trucks instead of people, we would have 94% fewer traffic fatalities. That's a million lives a year saved. Um, this will eliminate a lot of jobs, trucking jobs, but if you notice supply shortages in the UK, they are being blamed on the lack of lorry drivers. Uh, and so right now there's over a million uh, uh, driver jobs unfilled, the driver gap, um, which AI could address. So on the one hand, you know, we, we could solve these, these uh, challenges in last mile logistics. And on the other hand, you know, we, we could reduce employment globally by 5%. That's a huge number of people being thrown out of work. We're also seeing people voluntarily leaving work. You know, the, the, the kind of post-COVID effects has seen the emergence of what's being called the great resignation, where, where particularly a lot of 20 and 30 somethings have said, you know, I don't like the stress of working and kind of how work has been, I quit. And so we're gonna see some forced digital transformation of necessity. Businesses are gonna have to replace these jobs with machines just to keep going and keep growing. Um, and so that's going to create some interesting societal tensions. So we're going to now pop a poll up there and ask you, what percentage of jobs do you think are at risk from AI? So across all industry sectors, what percentage of jobs do you think are at risk from AI? Yes, so please launch the poll. It was just up for a second. There it is. Okay. Uh, this says poll results, Marna. I think you need to relaunch the poll so people can actually answer it. Okay, so 20%, 30%, 50%, 75%, nine, oh, that should be a 99%, fine, 95%. Um, what percentage of jobs do you think are at risk from AI? Take your best guess. We'll keep this open for, you know, 
15, 20 more seconds, and then we'll we'll see we'll see what you had to say. This one's interesting because you know some industries are more vulnerable to AI jobs disruption than others, and so the question becomes across every industry: what what do you think is the percentage of jobs at risk? All right. Myrna, do you want to close out the poll and let's see what, what the group had to say? What's the collective intelligence of our webinar attendees? Okay, so let's see. Um, oh, this is interesting. So we had a, a, an almost perfectly even distribution. It's not a normal distribution. It's, it's a third <laughs> said 30%, a third said 50%, a third said 75%, um, and only one bold person said 95 or 99%, however you want to say it. Um, okay, so... You know, the, the answer is across all sectors, about 30% is what's expected to be disrupted uh, kind of into the, the sort of, um, I think the labels are actually uh, reversed on this chart um, to the late uh, 2020s. So kind of within the next, let's say eight years or so, maybe a little less, seven years, um, we're, we're probably gonna see 30% job disruption. That's also sort of what we're gonna see across financial services, transport, would be more like 50% and, and health more like 20%. So if you think about health, you know, people still want to have a human being, you know, uh, give them a sponge bath or, or talk to them about health concerns. Um, whereas with transport, as I mentioned before, we could save a lot of lives and costs and address a lot of shortages uh, with AI. Um, and that one seems to be, you know, pretty profound and significant. So, um, that said, so while on the one hand, you know, we kind of have this idea of 30 to 50% jobs loss from, from AI, um, on the other hand, you know, there are some people who think that that might be too conservative. So at the last World Economic Forum meeting that was held in person in 2020, I heard people whispering in the hallways, 99% job loss. So there, there is definitely some concern that we could end up in a dystopic future that looks a lot like Wally, -E, uh, where everyone's out of work and the AIs run everything. Elon Musk calls AI the most likely cause of World War III. And, and he would have an informed perspective because he's invested heavily into AI uh, and backed the open AI company that, that created that, that GPT-3 platform I mentioned before that helped me write my book. We're certainly seeing a lot of weaponization of identity data using AI. Uh, so Cambridge Analytica and Facebook uh, um, uh, actively impacted major elections in 2016, both the US presidential election and uh, the Brexit referendum uh, here in the UK. Um, so think about you know, how many fake news impressions were, were um, uh, disseminated through these, these AI systems in 2016. Um, was, was it 5 million, 10 million, 100 million, maybe? The, the answer is that there were over 1 billion impressions that were shown to 150 million U.S. voters. So pretty much everyone in the U.S. who voted was exposed repeatedly to fake news. In the U.K., um, uh, the reports have concluded that there are over 150,000 uh, Russia-linked Brexit social media accounts. So the Russian intelligence services working with Internet Research Group uh, and Cambridge Analytica targeted people through social media across over 150,000 accounts um, to seek to influence their opinion on, on Brexit. And so to, to take that a step further, the, the National Bureau of Economic Research did a fairly exhaustive study of what happened with the Brexit referendum. So just to remind you, the Brexit referendum was quite close. Um, leave voting 51.9% and remain voting 41.8%. But if you strip out the effects of this fake news and these social media accounts, it is believed by the researchers at NIBR that um, it, the vote was pretty much a toss up and easily within the realm of, of statistical error could have gone the other way. Uh, it would have been um, maybe 50.1 to leave and 49.9 to remain with, with over 1.76% directly attributable to fake news and, and these uh, 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 AI bots that influence people's votes. And so without you know, 
judging anyone's opinion on this, whether you, you voted to leave or voted to remain, whether you think leave is good or you think remain is good, um, the fact is that the choice was taken away from the voters by state-sponsored action um, and enabled AI, AI that behaved in what I would term deeply unethical fashions. Former senior Facebook executives have, have very publicly said they're ashamed of having been a part of this catastrophic disruption of society. Uh, former senior executive uh, um, uh, from Facebook said, for example, he feels tremendous guilt that he enabled these tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. And so I find myself thinking, you know, maybe Orwell uh, was an optimist. Um, so, so I asked the question, you know, is our destiny written? You know, are we inevitably heading towards a, a future where, you know, AI either puts us out of work or even goes after us to try and get rid of us? Or, or is there another possibility? Can, can we create ethical AI? And should we? Is there, is there a possibility of creating trusted AI? So if you like science fiction, as I do, you, you may have read the uh, Isaac Asimov uh, uh, robot series. So um, he's in the, the media lately because they, they just launched a new foundation series. I think it's on Apple TV. But his other famous series of books was, were about intelligent robots. And he had this idea of three laws that would make sure that the robots did the right thing and did not do the wrong thing. So how do we implement that for, for our AI systems? Should we, in fact, implement these kinds of, you know, algorithmic ethics? Or should we just let the markets decide? And, and if we should, whose ethics should we implement? I, I have some good news, at least on that front, which is that it is possible to distill down for, for certainly four dozen countries, um, common shared values, pillars of what we could think of as trusted AI. Uh, this is the work of Luciano Floridi from Oxford and, and Joshua Cowles from Harvard. Um, and so they did this meta-analysis of 47 principles uh, and, and how they're applied across 42 countries. And they found the following five common values. One, the AI should exhibit benevolence, right? It should, it should be good. It should do something good. So a, a very simple and mercenary example would be, you know, the AI should uh, um, help me make more money in my stock portfolio. The AI should also exhibit non-malevolence. So in the process of doing something good for me, it shouldn't do something bad for someone else. So for example, um, if my AI figures out that it could, uh, um, make me a lot of money trading, oh, I don't know, rice. Uh, but if it did, it would cause a lot of people to starve because rice would suddenly become too expensive. Um, that would be an example of something bad happening. So we wanna make sure our AI in the process of doing something good does not do something bad. All right, autonomy is another one. We wanna make sure that the AI does what we want it to, if it's really gonna be trusted AI. We don't want it to develop a mind of its own and just go off and do whatever it wants to do. We don't want Skynet. We don't want the matrix. We want AI that does what we want it to do. The AI should incorporate principles of ju justice and fairness, right? So this is things like, you know, there's a lot of worry about algorithmic bias. You know, if we use AI to issue loans, will it issue loans fairly? So we have to incorporate these concepts of justice and fairness into the AI. And finally, we need explicability. The AI should be able to tell us how it arrived at a decision. This is important for human oversight. Trusted AI is potentially gonna be the new GDPR. So, so the general data protection regulation in, in the EU and UK help enshrine rights for individuals around their personal data and how it's dealt with and what they can do about it. Uh, the US copied with the, this in, in California with the California Consumer Privacy Act. Well, now the EU has proposed um, a regulation that would seek to govern AI. So let's do a quick poll here. And in thinking about sort of AI regulations, we wanna know, you know, what should the highest priority be around AI regulation? What's the most important thing? Is it managing systemic risk? Is it mitigating possible harm to society or individuals? 
you know, consumer protection? Um, is it to enable innovation? Or is it to foster stability? So, so what should policy makers be thinking about when they're looking at the, the priorities of AI regulation? So we'll give, we'll give you, you know, 10, 15 seconds to sort of think about your answer uh, and then we'll close the poll. Okay, so we're gonna take uh, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what we had to say. All right, so um, it looks like most of you think we wanna mitigate potential harms. And the next largest cohort were, were folks seeking to, to, to manage systemic risk and with, with innovation and stability being kind of minor uh, uh, answers. Um, so, so, you know, personally, I'm very focused on enabling innovation, but, but that doesn't mean it's the right answer. In fact, it doesn't mean where regulators are focusing. So if you look at um, what the new EU regulations are focused on, it's some combination of sort of mitigating harms and managing risk. Um, and they are taking, and don't confuse those two concepts, a risk-based approach to regulation, where there's unacceptable risk, high risk, limited risk, and minimal risk. Right? So unacceptable risk would be things that threaten safety, livelihood, human rights, like social scoring. Okay, China has a social scoring thing that determines where you can live and if you can travel and what job you can get. Um, that's been banned, right? Or would be banned under the new regulation. High risk would be things like using AI to screen jobs candidates or for credit scoring or for law enforcement applications. The high risk activities will be very heavily uh, uh, regulated and governed. Limited risk would be things like chatbots, you know, and in those cases, um, it's a disclosure, it's a transparency issue. It's just, you just have to tell someone that they're talking to a chatbot and not a human being. And finally, um, minimal risk is not gonna be regulated, right? So, so AI inside video games or spam filters, you know, things that are going on now that are viewed as innocuous will, will, will not be regulated. Um, and so when you think about the, the high risk systems, which also represent some areas of significant opportunity, uh, such as, you know, issuing loans to people without credit histories by using AI analytics and alternative credit scoring. Um, first of all, the company needs to demonstrate that they have good risk assessment mitigation systems. Um, Make sure that we don't have algorithmic bias because the data is, uh, that's used to train the AI is bad. Uh, so looking at quality of data sets. Um, log what happens so that downstream, if they have to do an audit, you have traceability to the results. Detailed documentation that will help uh, authorities make sure that the system is, is compliant. Inform consent for the user human in the loop oversight, which helps minimize risk and, and, and ensuring that these AI algos are, are very robust, secure, and accurate. This is all published online, so you can certainly find it uh, uh, on the EU website and also others have analyzed this, this proposed legislation. The question that I ask as I start to really think about this uh, more deeply is, how can we scale trusted AI? Right, so um, I, I've been, you know, sort of wrestling with this question for a while, and and now I'm working with some collaborators to develop uh, uh, an approach where, you know, maybe we can create some algorithmic methods for trusted AI. Maybe there are ways that we could create an ecosystem of AI companies and projects and researchers across multiple universities um, that that really. Uh, um, uh, you know, can have um, a code base to draw from. If you think back to that slide earlier where I talked about Asimov's three laws or the, the, the subsequent slide about the five pillars of trusted AI, what if that were in, in software that you could just plug the, you know, the ethics module into your system to make sure that things are, 
are working the way they're supposed to. So at Imperial, um, we are certainly working towards these and related ends. Um, we've started a new AI ventures class to help people launch companies and, and projects inside big companies. Um, it's the first elective collaboration uh, uh, between the business school and, and the engineering school. Um, so we have uh, in the spring, a mixed cohort of students, uh, uh, about 40% engineering students, 60% uh, business students coming together to form project-based teams and build new kinds of AI. Um, we have a hackathon coming up about AI and the future of work, uh, December 3rd through the 5th. So I'll, I'll invite Myrna to, to take the stage in, in a few minutes towards the end uh, to kind of talk you through the hackathon. But if you're on this call, uh, we hope that you will join us for the hackathon. We, we would love to see you there. It's an open hack. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to be an Imperial student to participate. Uh, and we will have uh, cash and non-cash prizes uh, to recognize uh, the most interesting and, and innovative ideas. Um, and finally, as I said, we, we are engaged in uh, the beginnings of some translational research. This question both of how do we take all this great AI research that goes on in the UK and, and bring it out into the world uh, better? Uh, so how do we accelerate commercialization pathways? And also, in doing so, in building these new AI ventures, how do we make sure that they are ethical, that they have perhaps this, this trusted AI as, as a, an integral part of how those ventures are architected? Um, so the translational AI lab that I head up uh, is, is dedicated towards trying to generate answers to some of those questions. Um, I'm gonna close my talk and, and we'll open questions in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, with, with a, a little bit of fanciful imagining, right? So, uh, so this book that I mentioned, Augmenting Your Career, uh, uh, How to Win at Work in the Age of AI, this, this book I just published, um, I kind of end the book envisioning what it would be like if JFK were, were here today, if he were the president of the US today, let's say, and, and were instead of having a big bold speech about the space race, what if he were giving a speech about the AI race and, and a national uh, interest around AI and, and a global interest around AI. He, he might say the following. He might say, the future is near and we are going to embrace it. We choose to embrace AI, to nurture a better society, not because it is easy, but because it is difficult. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and there are new rights to be won and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. You can find my books at uh, davidschreier.com slash books. And I am happy to now uh, take questions. So I think we can put those questions in the chat. It looks like we've already got one, but certainly feel free to put any questions you have into the chat. All right, so Neil asks, are developed country governments preparing for the potential of mass unrest due to severe job loss within the next five to 10 years? Um, the answer is yes and no. So there are a number of countries that are starting to put in place uh, national reskilling programs, ranging from the UK to the US to Singapore and elsewhere but they are underfunded. We've not, not put enough money to work against, uh, um, uh, against you know, preparing for this draconian shift in our labor force. And, and we already are seeing the damages from not doing that in the past. So in, in the beginning part of my book, what, what I call out is that, um, you, you know, if you look at the voting patterns for both the US presidential election and the, and the UK Brexit referendum, um, the vote was already very close. And if you look at where people voted to, you know, disrupt the, you know, the, the system, to, to tip over the chessboard, um, it was in a lot of labor and manufacturing intensive voting districts, you know, places where, you know, like the Midlands, the, the British steel industry was, was thrown out of work en masse. And these people were not retrained really for, for other employment. And so you have a bunch of people who are on the dole who are angry that they've been left behind by the you know, uh, uh, technology revolution um, and they're expressing with their votes. In the US, a lot of the 
um, traditional manufacturing centers, likewise, and Detroit, you know the sort of the car manufacturing centers and others also were, were expressing deep unhappiness with globalization at the polls. Um, and so I think that, you know the AI crisis could be even bigger, and and I think that we urgently need to invest in in reskilling people and preparing for that 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 disrupted future. Um, Eric Brynjolfsson is a professor now at Stanford, uh, used to be at, at uh, MIT. Um, he has likened the, the sort of fourth industrial revolution, you know, the, the AI disruption to be on par with the first industrial revolution. So if you think about that for a minute, right? The first industrial revolution gave us uh, the railroad, right? The steam engine, the railroad, telegraph, telephone, so now we can move people and goods faster from place to place. We can move information even faster and connect people all over the world. Um, uh, but uh, at the same time, it also gave us uh, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and World War I. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that happened as a consequence of this massive automation entering and changing how everybody worked and lived. Um, so let's see. Uh, Another question, uh, how long would it take to update education, all levels, to catch up with the concept and by doing so, allow more people to be prepared for the future? Um, you know, so, so the, the um, interesting thing is we can actually use AI to help people um, learn faster. Uh, and we can use AI to help people get knowledge in their brain faster and, and, and reskill and retrain. Um, and so in theory, you can have people reskilled in a year or less. Um, getting it rolled out across the world is going to take a lot longer, and this is largely due to political will rather than a lack of, of education material or even digital education capacity. And, and in the interest of full disclosure, I am involved in educating people about fintech and blockchain and AI. Um, so you know, I am talking my own book here, but uh, I, I do think it's critically important for the future. Uh, let's see. Another question from John. Um, thank you for your lecture. What role do you think civil society has in ensuring AI is safe and transparent? Um, I, think, I think there is a significant uh, role for, for all of us. Um, you know, we can, uh, so for one thing, we have to, to uh, educate and support AI innovators, which includes both the, the programmers and technologists and also the business people working with them in um, uh, uh, in understanding what they're building and the implications and impacts of it. But we also need an AI literate population and a data literate population. So people understand that they're interacting with AIs and people understand that if they take advice from an AI, what, what does that mean? And what has, been, what, what has gone into that AI? And is it the right AI to give you advice? Um, so I do think we need more political will to fund um, more investment in AI education, in AI literacy, and in AI innovation, as well as critically this uh, this this whole notion of, of uh, a better governance, a better ethics of AI. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alan asked the question. Hold on. I just want to see. There's another. Um, yeah. So Neil notes that the last revolution had tens of decades for the workforce to accommodate. That's right. This is gonna be potentially even more disruptive than the first industrial revolution. Um, let's say I'm gonna pick up because I'm going back and forth between the Q and A and the chat. Um, let's see, uh, are there AI applications in cybersecurity that would be considered as low hanging fruit in terms of immediate benefit? Um, the answer is yes, absolutely. In fact, Cybersecurity today is as much uh, AI versus AI. I call it the battle of machines. Uh, you know, the, the, there's more like human oversight than there is human intervention. Um, and, and so there, it, it's a big area for continued investment and growth because it's a perpetual arms race. The, the hackers, uh, the bad guy hacker, black hat hackers develop a new AI to attack and the defenders develop a better AI to defend, and they're constantly going back and forth. So lots of opportunity there. Um, your book compares who's stronger in the world of technology, man or machine? No, actually, um, what my book concludes, not to tell you the answer, but you, you may be interested to see how I got to the answer. Human and machine working together can do things that neither one can do by themselves. And so it's this idea of these 
hybrid systems that is incredibly powerful. The opportunity is to um, take uh, uh, the best of each and bring them together. So for example, um, a, a group of people like this group on the call right now, a group of people combined with an AI can do things like predict the future very, very accurately. And I don't just say that as a concept. We've actually run experiments that have demonstrated this and then published peer reviewed journal articles on it. Uh, and so we know that it really works. And that's incredibly amazing and powerful. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, what about cybersecurity risks in the near future, adversarial attacks and machine learning? Yeah, I mean, that, this is one of the, the issues and the EU kind of talks about this in their proposed legislation um, to, to uh, um, basically secure the AI systems. If you have an AI decisioning engine you don't want to hand over control to it and then have someone hack it and make it do bad decisions. Um, so we need to not only have transparent AI and trusted AI, but we also need to have secure AI. Uh, let's see. Um, hmm. Okay, this is an interesting, I'm gonna try and read this. Could there ever be a time where financing a business clone of a Berkshire Hackaway portfolio is democratized? in efforts to increase access of, to capital. Could that happen before the trillionification of things? That way people are in the money on the equity and earning dividends in perpetuity from companies that have unlimited access to money. Um, you know, someone would argue that that's Ethereum, right? Someone would say, if you look at Ethereum, Ethereum sort of powers a lot of different kinds of businesses now and increasingly so. Um, the whole DeFi industry is sort of building, built on Ethereum infrastructure. And so, or not the whole, but my, a lot of it, many applications of it, um, or Tezos or what have you. So, so there, there are those who could argue that, that certain forms of cryptocurrency are actually providing this opportunity for um, uh, democratized access to capital. It's not quite so clean. It's certainly not run the way Berkshire Hathaway is run. And it's certainly possible that that could be done. I will also point you to things like Cedars, uh, where you know it is possible now for more people to get democratized access to investments in uh, in tech startups um, and diversify their portfolio. Um, so, so you know these are not quite exactly what you're suggesting, but they are they are aspects or elements of it. And and you know I think maybe this needs to be the next great fintech. Maybe you'll start it. Okay, other questions? These are good questions, by the way, keep going. Um, so given that almost 30% of jobs will be replaced by AI, how about hybrid human and AI uh, or, how, or human only jobs? How many jobs would it be? Uh, I mean, billions, I don't know. I mean, think, think of how many people in, around the world have jobs, you know? Why don't we say a billion as a starting point? Billion jobs at risk. Might be more, but that's a starting point. That's a lot of jobs to, to upskill, reskill, and, and, and upskill, reskill, and uh, reshape in you know, five to 10 years. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments before I turn things to Myrna to talk about our Oh, here, we've got a couple more. Okay. Um, do, you, do you foresee AI to develop internationally across borders and in a way bring the world further together or widen the gap between more developed and less developed countries? Oh, good question. So um, I would love for there to actually be uh, um, democratized AI. And I think TensorFlow being open source is a great step. But the reality is, um, we are seeing a widening gap between rich and poor. We've seen it under COVID, where the digitally enabled nations were less adversely impacted than developing nations with poor connectivity. Um, so, you know, I can see the urgency of trying to address this inequity because it, it could create some significant problems in, in uh, you, you know, the next 20 years. Uh, it could lead to, you know, in combination with climate change, it could lead to mass migration, civil unrest, and, and the breakdown of law and order if it's not addressed. 
Uh, let's see, another question. You've touched on this bit already, but could you expand on where you think a university can make a difference in this issue? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, look, the universities have two products, right? People and ideas. They also have some strengths like convening power, right? We can bring lots of people together to talk about important issues in a safe space where we can remove, you know, uh, uh, um, commercial interests. We can get government and private sector and, and researchers to all talk to each other without having to have a deal on the table. Uh, and so we can we can explore sort of higher order issues and problems. Um, so, so with that as kind of feedstock, what we're trying to do is create an agenda around these issues for AI at, at Imperial, for one thing, but across a network of other universities for another. Um, and so a university can foster intellectual freedom to explore risky ideas without fear of repercussions. University can create a safe space for someone to develop their ideas uh, without uh, being afraid of being criticized or, or scaling prematurely or commercializing prematurely. Um, a university can facilitate that path of commercialization to help improve the success trajectory of the business when it does go out into the real world. Uh, university can foster dialogue uh, with regulators, uh, with industry and, and amongst researchers to shape um, not only a better ecosystem that serves the needs of humanity, but also uh, that addresses some of these risks and harms that we talked about earlier. Um, so I don't wanna claim that universities are the answer or the only answer, but I do think that universities have an important role to play. Uh, universities also obviously can build capacity. We can help teach people, not just our undergraduate and MBA students or graduate students or masters or PhD students, but, but teach working adults how to engage with these new technologies. So, so we took this on-campus AI ventures class that I mentioned that we created for our master's students and we created a version of it for, for, uh, um, for working professionals, for someone who might be 40 years old, not 25 years old, who has a day job, but wants to learn, or maybe who lives in Singapore or, or in uh, Mumbai or in Cape Town or uh, you know, in, in Mexico City and they want to learn about AI and how it will uh, you know, sort of affect the future. And, and the, we put that online. And so um, you know, there are a lot of ways which I think universities uh, have a role to play, but everyone here on this, on this webinar also has a role to play. Thank you. Um, let's see. Now there's always a good question. What do I need to become AI literate in the short term besides reading your book? Uh, well, I, I mean, now I will talk my own uh, uh, interests. Um, you could take the Imperial AI Startups and Innovation class. It's available online uh, and it, it will provide you a good foundation uh, in six weeks uh, in, in what AI is all about and what to do about it and how to shape a, a venture that actually could do something. That venture could be inside a big company as a corporate initiative, or it could be an independent startup, or it could be a policy initiative for a government. Um, and certainly everyone here is welcome to come hack with us uh, December 3rd through the uh, 5th. And, and I think that's a good segue for, what, oh, hold on. There's one more question uh, and then I'll segue. Uh, hand thanks to Myrna. Um, let's say a person has jointly created something useful for society. Over time, it has lost its relevance. A person is getting old, but AI is not. Does this mean you need to come up with something new? Uh, to update? I, I guess I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, there is something interesting that's happening, which is we can create digital twins and they're getting better. So right now I am working on creating uh, a DaveBot. Uh, so DaveBot has read about 200,000 words of things that I've written about AI and, and cybersecurity and FinTech. And it is, um, it's going to do like this Q and A, except that you can do this Q and A anywhere, anytime, whenever you want. You could talk to me, and I could give you my answers, or at least a digital twin of me that would give you the answer I would give if I were doing the the conversation. Um, so that's sort of one way we could preserve ourselves in perpetuity. Uh, but uh, you know, there there may be others. All right, and with that, I want to thank you all for uh, your attention. Uh, I do encourage you to stay on just a couple minutes more because Myrna is going to share with you a little bit about this 
hackathon that we're running uh, December 3rd through the 5th. Thank you so much, David. I have so many nice quotes <laughs> to summarize your, your talk. Um, I think my favorite one probably is human and machines working together can do things that either can do by themselves. So that was one of the several that you said today. And definitely there's a lot to learn and a lot to reflect. And that's exactly what we're trying to do and the mission of the Center for Digital Transformation at Imperial College. And as David just said, uh, we are very, very excited to uh, organize this very first hackathon. Our center is quite new and we are <clears throat> inviting organizations to join, uh, posing challenges. Um, and of course the community, uh, we are inviting graduate students, uh, practitioners and the community overall to join us uh, with the very same talk that you just heard from David, uh, how will artificial intelligence transform the future of work? And the future of work uh, in terms of processes, definitely that would be transformed in terms of society, in terms of people, how we need to learn, uh, how do we need to think of our children, uh, learning new things, learning new uh, both soft and hard skills to interact with machines because this is definitely coming. So these are different reflections that we will uh, try to answer in this hackathon. And as I was saying, uh, we are inviting all of you, uh, graduate students uh, from different universities, practitioners and community members to join us uh, with an open mind. And we have been already socializing this presentation. Uh, this is not only a coding <laughs> hackathon. So many companies ask, organizations ask, do we need to know how to program and are we going to code any super algorithm because this is an AI hackathon? So um, actually not. Um, there are different ways that you can participate and create value and co-create together with your teams. Uh, teams will be small. We don't want teams bigger than five. We really want teams to interact and co-create to solve the different challenges that yeah. will be and presented. Yes. Just to be clear, you can create a business plan or a business strategy and pitch that. You do not need to actually create code. Exactly. So that was one, uh, one key point I wanted to share because we have been socializing this with different organizations and, and with different people. So uh, you don't need to be an expert. So you can join, you're interested to learn. Uh, you are definitely welcome. And uh, this is the link to join and to register to the hackathon. Uh, we are we are trying to be as flexible as, as possible learning from the, the COVID times. So we will have a hackathon uh, on site in, in campus, uh, a, a location where we will meet. And we'll have also an online version running parallel for these 48 hours. I will share now the agenda. And um, you can join either way. And also you can register as an individual but you can also register as a team. So if you have a group of enthusiasts or a group of experts or whomever you are, you can join as an individual or already come together in a team. Uh, we will have this judging criteria. And right now what we are doing is having conversations with different uh, sectors and organizations to pose their challenges. And uh, although there will be a, a different uh, number of challenges, we will judge the, the, the outcomes. Uh, with these five criteria, novelty, feasibility, scalability, the pitch, and the overall creativity. So this will be the, the, the judging criteria and we'll have different judges, both from universities, not only Imperial, and also uh, from uh, organizations, companies, and, and so on. And this is our agenda. We will get together in Imperial uh, at night and in the evening on the Friday the 3rd to get to know each other and to have uh, some drinks and fun. Uh, because hackathons is all about also having fun and network and learn and then we will come back on the saturday we will open up with an with a keynote we will present the challenges and then teams will start working understanding their challenge empathizing with potential users ideating and prototyping and one of the lessons learned that we have uh, with the different experiences organizing hackathons is that teams will present and they will receive feedback. So we, we will end the first day like this to come back on the Sunday and iterate the second time to do the, the, the let's say, to include and enrich the solution, business plan, strategy, code, uh, sketch, uh, I don't know, whatever uh, is, is coming out from the team to pitch that presentation 
and then get to know by the end of the day at around 4.30, who's the winner and, and closing the hackathon. So as I was saying, we'll have a location as venue in our campus at Imperial College. And also at the same time, we'll have the online version. And well, and last but not least, uh, I'm the executive director of the Center for Digital Transformation. And just to share, and I also uh, appreciate very much all the amazing things uh, David sh shared about the university. And actually, yes, that's what we want to create. We want to create this, this safe space where entrepreneurs, governments, uh, and, and companies, students can research, can share insights, and can get, come together to solve society uh, challenges in regards to digital transformation. And these are our key activities from building up the ecosystem, bridge, research, raise awareness, and for sure publish um, all our academic research. Uh, so we thank you all for joining. I don't know if there's any other final question. David, any, anything else in regards to the hackathon because you have been working so hard also to invite organizations around the globe so anything else that you would like to share? Yeah, I, I mean, it's gonna be a very exciting multi-institutional event. We have uh, various other universities that will be sending teams in. Uh, we've got some fantastic uh, uh, sponsors and mentors and coaches lining up uh, and uh, um, you know, really just a great group of people coming together to help explore this idea of how will AI play out in the future of work? Thank you, David. I don't see any other question. Um, okay, what was the URL for the AI event page, event right page? Yes, I will be sending um, the, the video, the, the information about the hackathon uh, and also about this uh, Digitalk afterwards. So you will definitely get the, let me, let me copy paste right away in any case. Um, uh, please uh, also feel free to, to contact us. To contact Just to me. be clear, this is this will have a virtual component. You can hack from anywhere in the world. So it is not just for people who can come in person to London. Yes. We, we are both in point. person and online for this hackathon. Even in London, there's some people who don't feel comfortable uh, in a large crowd. So uh, we have provided this virtual option. Perfect. I don't see any other questions, Dave. Eh? So we'll be sharing this video on the presentation. So thank you all. And we'll come back to you with our next uh, information and, and hackathon. Um, more details about the awards and the prizes and everything. So stay safe. Thank you for joining and see you soon. Have a great day. Thank you, Dave. Bye-bye.